The International Woodworking Fair, or IWF for short, is the place where cutting edge technologies are showcased for the woodworking industry. This show has been around since 1948 and is North America's largest display of machinery, materials, and tools for woodwork. This year, TNT was invited to attend, and it was awesome. If you're one of the people who wanted to attend but didn't get the chance, no worries. We filmed the whole experience and got exclusive interviews from industry leaders. Epic machine demonstrations were plentiful. Plus, we got schooled by Bob Benke from Tightbond about glue-ups. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. So, there are three sections of this whole conference, right? The first section is like robotics and really like really futuristic stuff. Yeah. The second section is industrial machines. Like, so machines that are pumping out crazy amount of they material. They need their own warehouse. 2,000 feet per minute kind of stuff, right? And this third section here is based off the finish work. There's a lot of cabinets, hardwood suppliers, cabinet doors. Uh, we got like feet, tight bonds here. It's all of like the smaller stuff. But the other two sections have some crazy futuristic stuff. In the future, we're not going to be sanding. A robot arm is. Totally. In the future, we're not going to be drilling holes. Nope. The robot arm is. Definitely. So robots are coming for our woodworking jobs. <laughs> and we're going to buy one. Yeah, we got one. So we're here at IWF, and one of the most frequent things we use in our wood shop is tight bond glue. Today, we're lucky enough to get Bob here, and he's gonna give us a little spiel about the different types of glues and the different things that tight bond offers. So, so we manufacture, I mean, and, and offer quite a, a variety of glues. A lot of them what we call our specialty lines, but our big ones are tight bond original two and three, which we call the big three. These guys over here. That's right. So. We have Type On Original, which is the glue that really took over the furniture manufacturer, right? right. Um, you know, back in the 50s uh, when the glue was awful, uh, we came up with the Type On Original. It displaced high glue from, yeah. from, from the industry. Didn't and, have to and, mix and anything. that was the story, yeah. right? So that is the exact same formula from the 1950s that Original came out. Great speed for manufacturing. So that's, you know, obviously it was a manufacturing glue. Good speed time set, um, but not water resistant. So we would get calls for, well, we need a water resistant glue, but we really like the Type On Original. So we came up with Type On 2. Uh, it has the same set characteristics, five minutes open time, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to get it finally clamped, and really a 30 minute clamp time. Then you can take it out of the clamps and move on. Right, good gotcha. production glue. Um, at some point in time, people were asking us, well, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty fast, and I've got a more complicated glue up. So at that point, we developed our Type On 3, which gives you 10 minutes of open time, 20 to 25 minutes to get it set. But of course, it takes a little bit longer for it to set, so you're going to be about two hours in the clamps. And you know, we say 30 minutes, but that's, I mean, yeah. you can get away with it, but you would better behave pretty well. You better be straight. That's yeah. right. And so that, that kind of encompasses our other line. We have glues that set faster, even than the Type On Original, our new speed set. Um, we have glues that glue to plastic surfaces, you know, wood, wood to, plastic? to plastic, which is our melamine glue. Oh. So, so again, we have a lot of specialty glues. We'll have Type On 2 in a, in a very dark color for, you know, yeah, mahogany dark, and things yeah. like that. So a lot of different varieties. Um, uh, what would be some of the reasons someone would want to use Type Bond Original over Type Bond 3 or Type Bond 2 over Type Bond Original? What are some differences and where, do, where are their strengths? So, so the Type Bond 2 and the Type Bond uh, Original, very similar. Okay, so you would use one if, if you're just doing indoor stuff, it's, it's a little bit less expensive uh, if you don't need the water resistance. Gotcha. If you do need the water resistance and you like how fast the Type Bond Original works, then you would move to Type Bond 2. If, if you just need more time, and, and most of the, how do you say, the do-it-yourself or woodworkers who are not production uh, people, really love Type On 3. Um, most of the problems we run into to an original is that, you know, they'll call, the, their bonds are falling apart, and when we analyze them, it's just because the glue set too fast on it. Gotcha, so the glue dries before it's able to soak into the wood grain, and then in, in turn that, what's the chemical in wood that this glue so it glues to cellulose, cellulose uh, and the glue it. really doesn't soak into it. Okay. Um, and it's not a mechanical bond into the pores of the wood. 
If that was the oh. case, if that was the case, end grain to end grain would be your strongest bond. Gotcha. Because you have the most pores there, but it's not. Uh, so how, how does wood glue? How does it work then? How does? So so cellulose in the wood has got um, a chemical structure which allows for kind of an electrostatic, like a little magnet. Okay. So it's got a positive and a negative charge to it. Uh, the glue also does that, and so it will link together like little magnets. And so it's just linked to the cellulose. And that's why oily tropical woods typically don't bond very well until you get rid of the oil. That frees up the cellulose, and so then the glue can hit, get to those magnets, whereas the oil will tend to keep the glue from getting to it. So would that be like wiping the edge with alcohol or something first? With alcohol, we, we recommend acetone. Acetone, okay. So acetone stronger. just because it, it tends to dissolve the, glue, the, the oils better. Um, and alcohols can sometimes contain water right. well, or either they're denatured, which is usually they'll put some oils in it to denature it. Yeah. And so now you're just putting oil back on the wood. So acetone tends to be clean, works fast, uh, pulls all of the oils out of the out of the wood. That's awesome. I didn't know that. And there's little magnets. Why when you break a, a joint or a seam that you've glued, why does it break on the wood? So so there's gazillions of these hydroxyl groups is what they're called. They're okay. oxygen hydrogen bonds in the in the cellulose. And they're all along the chains of the wood. So you've taken a neodymium magnet and tried to pull it off of a refrigerator. Let's say you put 10,000 of those magnets on your fridge and then try to pull the whole thing off at once, yeah. right? You'll pull the door off. Right. It's the same concept. There's just so many of these little tiny magnets in there that they add up to an incredible holding force. Wow. To the point where the wood will fail before that occurs. That's some interesting chemistry. That's for yes, sure. and, and, and that's what makes wood amazing. So we're actually really interested in the speed set you guys have over here. Okay. And how is the strength on that? Like, are these measured in like different pounds of? So it's measured in pounds per square inch. So you know, let's say you yeah. have a one square inch. The type on original will hold it about thirty six hundred pounds per square inch. Okay. So I got a square inch. I pick up your car. <laughs> yeah. Right? Type on two is a little bit stronger at about 3750. Um, type on up to 4000. Type on three up to 4000. The speed set is going to be about 4100. Oh, now, wow. Now, what I will tell you uh -huh. is it doesn't matter. Yeah. And right. the reason for that is domestic hardwoods will tend to break around uh, 1500 to 2500 psi. Gosh. So that's why the wood breaks before the glue line typically does. That makes a lot of sense Right, now. so I mean, yeah. I can use a 10,000 PSI glue on balsa wood, but balsa wood's gonna break around 90, yeah. right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's always your weakest link in the chain is going to dictate how strong your, um, how you say, your joint's going to be. Gotcha. Another question I have, because I just heard this, we, Tyler and I have been, whenever we're gluing our tables together and our tops together and all of our wood, we're squeezing, we're, wrenching down the clamps is that should we be pu putting that kind of pressure that's we're... actually opposite of what you should do <laughs> there we go <laughs> um so we we've done a test okay um where we were testing um clamping pressure versus bond strength and we did it on softwood poplar and then we did hard maple and then we did jatoba which is real hard. a real yeah. hard wood what we found, so, and then we did three different pressures. So one was a, just a five pound weight on there, which put 0.6 pounds of pressure yeah. on, per square inch on the glue line, right? And then we did our, what we typically recommend, um, 100 PSI for the soft wood, medium density woods, typically 150 pounds per square inch, and then 200 for the, the hardwoods, uh, you know, the hard tropicals. And then we used 1,000 PSI, because there was a paper that was put out in 1998 that said, you know, usually you go up to about 1,000 pounds before you see a real loss in strength. So we tested those. In every case, we found that the five pound weight gave the strongest bond. So we've kind of changed our, <laughs> our clamping pressure recommendations to just put enough pressure on to close the joints to keep them in contact during that drying process. That will give you the strongest joint. What we feel at, so the softwoods were not quite as affected by the difference in, in pressure. So the, 
the poplar only lost about 10 to 15 percent strength. Okay. When we went to the maple, we lost 25 to 35 percent strength, going from the five pound weight to a thousand psi. On the hardwood, we lost 75 to 50 percent. So oh, what wow. we so what we feel is happening is that wow. as you crank down the pressure on there, you squeeze all of the glue out of the joint, and you end up with a starved glue joint. The harder the wood, the less ability the glue has to force its way into the pores of the wood and actually leave you some glue in there. So, so we, we've kind of changed our recommendations. We still feel the, and we still publish the 100 PSI because we, we see that for most of the domestic hardwoods, that's actually not too bad. And if your joints don't fit 100% well, you're gonna to have to force that wood More, yeah. to, to get into position. And that's about the pressure you're gonna to need to get them in. And, and, and you kind of think about it and you go, yeah, you know what? My closer fitting joints do seem to be stronger than those that are a little gappy, right? And so it makes sense that you don't have to force those joints together to get squeeze out than say you do one that's a little more gappy, right? And so you tend to put less pressure on a better fitting joint than you do on one that doesn't fit as well. You're right, you're totally right. In practicality sense, when we have a little bow and we're trying to close it, you know, we have to really, have to really down. crank down. If on they it. set perfectly, we don't really have to crank down. And now we're going to stop cranking down on every one of our tabletops. And that's what I would recommend to yeah. everybody in your audience too. That, you know, just back, up, back it up. Cinch it tight, but you don't need that extra half turn in there. Just, just leave it, let it dry, and you'll get some good, nice, strong joints. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how important it is to have like sharp tools. So remember when we talked about the little neodymium magnets, the little right. cellulose, right? When your tools are dull, you're going to get what's called burnishing. In some cases, you'll see the blackened right, portion right. of the wood. But in some cases, you'll see that it's just shiny. Well, in that particular process, you're actually burning the cellulose and taking all those little magnets and burning them off. And so now you, can't, you have the glue, which bonds to those, have much fewer places to bond to. Right. And so your, your glue line can be very, very weak especially on burnished wood yeah so the takeaway here make sure our knives are straight yep make sure our wood is cut as straight and flat as possible that is correct and put just the right amount of pressure to get the boards to touch that is correct awesome and, and then you'll have the strongest bonds that that wood is capable of giving you that is in awesome that case. and then if you do run into burnishing issues um, a nice hand plane finish just take off that surface layer, just get you down to some good, nice, fresh cellulose. That's what it's gonna bond to. That's awesome. And another takeaway, so if you have an oily wood, like a, like most a lot of exotics, but some domestics, right? Yep. You wanna hit that with acetone first right. to so get you, to the cellulose. If, if you use a white rag and you wipe it and the rag comes back with some stuff on it, mm -hmm. so you know, usually it's it's an orangish yellow, mm -hmm. keep wiping. Because you you're Until otherwise it's clean. you're otherwise you're just pushing oil around. So get to a new spot on the rag, keep wiping. If the rag comes back still with yeah. some oil in there, keep wiping until you get a fresh surface. And then you want to get the glue down right away because that wood still has oil in it. So it's go that's going to come to yes. the surface, right? So get the glue on. Once the glue is on there, it's a water-based product. Water and oil don't yeah. mix, so then the oil won't come to the surface. Wow, well, I really appreciate your time and giving us all this information. Very valuable to us. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. We have found the ultimate finish. It's called Clean Armor. This is a cross-linked polymer UV cured coating that can be used on woods, metals, and plastics. This finish features marine grade durability, abrasion and impact resistance, and is VOC free. Matthew, the creator and CEO of Clean Armor, spent 20 years developing this incredible finish so that it would check all of the durability boxes while being 100% safe and crystal clear. They were generous enough to give us a full demonstration of the process. Prep work is very important with this finish because of how optically clear it is. Sanding needs to be perfect because swirl marks and imperfections will be highlighted and stick out. Once your sanding is out of the way, be sure to get rid of all the fine dust. Brilliant idea taping a couple of brushes onto an air nozzle and spraying over a downdraft table. To ensure all the extra dust is cleaned away, 
Wipe with acetone. Clean armor can be applied with a sprayer, brush, or roller. For this demonstration, they sprayed it. One of the cool things about this finish is that it can be built up layer by layer until you get to your desired thickness. You can leave it thin for the real wood feel or build it up like an epoxy-like top coat. However, it's important to lay down even layers and fully cure in between coats. As I said before, this finish uses a UV LED to cure and it only takes two minutes for full durability. What's great is that the handheld lights are super cheap and you can use overhead LED strips to cure big projects with ease. In 30 minutes, they were able to finish two guitar bodies, front and back, and it came out beautiful. The flame maple on this body really pops. I can't wait to see how it looks on a countertop. Here we go, guys. If you're not getting a robot in the future, wasting your time here. Oh, it has a sander on it. Yeah, and it switches. Just quick, quick attach. Oh. Oh. No way. Oh, okay. Might as well sand it real quick. Wow. impressive dude. yeah that's it's really impressive. impressive oh here wait there's there's another robot yeah hold on more. a second right like it works because you're there yeah right so like oh, this is for the oh for the finishing oh look it's got a laser on it <laughs> uv light <laughs> uv yeah what yeah. uv get correct on tiktok again hey vestings where's your uh, robotic arm laser yeah we'd like to get that one this is Hell the future you. of woodworking right here. How do you get one of these to work for you full time? <laughs> what? What? Hundred thousand dollars of yours, dude. You can you can bring it home on the plane with you back to Plant City. Dude, it's a hundred grand. Yeah, this is the the Some real one. Some door here. robotics here. Yeah. All those other robots. Nah, look at these guys. Oh man. We'll just pick that up real quick. No big deal. Another door done. Wow. Pick that one up. No big deal. Guess we need to drill. All right, that's cool. So we were walking by this booth and I noticed that it looked like there were some good bits here. And here we got Tracy. Hey, good morning. Tell us about these bits. I'll tell you what, they're made in the US, Ronan, Montana, and 
very high quality. This, for instance, is a 29-piece cobalt drill bit set. Super high quality. If you're looking to drill heavy or heat-treated heat metal, this is what you're going to want to oh, use. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple different items. Here's our brad point bits. If you're a woodworker, you definitely need to check this out. It's a patented brad point. Uh, the tip, you can probably see the tip. Yeah. Cuts fast and leaves clean exit holes. Nice. So you're all good there. Awesome. And where can, where can we find you? Just online? Uh, you can get them online. You can get them at some A stores and you can get them at Menards. Okay. Uh, definitely. There's also check out Rockler Woodcraft. Uh, woodpeckers, those types of guys. They, they stock our stuff as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, man. Thank you. Real impressive. Now, this is the cutting edge of chop saws right here. Double-ended. Look at those slides. Amazing dust extraction. With digital stops, you set it, and it... Oh. So even in the chop saw game, there's a lot to improve on. Yeah, even in the chop saw game. These are our brothers right here. Tyler, that's us. Hey, that is us. Oh wait, they got double. They got yeah. double. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, not us, but it's almost wait, does that us. Make 16 because they put eight together. Look, they got the flop here. Oh, we got brake boosters on all of them. So they sent us a little panel flattening clamp, but they have this whole machine here that does everything. And They've it looks like out. looks like they make doors with this. Here we got another door clamp, I guess. Wow. And then this is basically our setup here, guys. Don't forget, use comb farm made if you're gonna get a JLT clamp system. Hey Tyler, we're missing something on our what? clamp system, Tyler. Look at this. Hey. Hey, dude. Yeah, we don't have that. This is what we were talking about. That's exactly what I was talking about, dude. <laughs> That's exactly what you're talking about. Oh. So you can make that. But dude, look at this. Uh... I know it's an it's impressive clamp, angled. Yeah. Right. What is that clamp? Everything. <laughs> ten by tens. So in a typical typical flooring plant, you end up with random length boards, kind of like what you see here. Gotcha. And generally, they show up, and it's just a giant mess. And there's one person's job to take these boards and make an organized row out of them but there's such a high quantity that's coming towards you, it's really hard to do. So one person can really do about 2,000 square feet. What we did is we took that job of making these rows and making them into bundles and we automated the entire thing. So what you're gonna see is I'm gonna load the board, the machine up with some boards. We're gonna simulate them and measure them and send that to the computer. Once it gets to the computer, the computer figures out how to organize them to build the bundles that you see. Oh, so, nice. So, so they're already bundled how they're going to get used. Yeah, yeah. So basically, in the flooring world, when you're making something like two and a quarter right there, it's about 19 and a half square foot. So generally, if you're packaging by hand, you're going to be somewhere like 19.9, 20 square foot. We're usually around the ballpark at 19.49. So we're very, very accurate. We know exactly right. what's in the bundle. All of that information is stored in the computer. So you can actually go to one of those bundles, go to the computer and see every single board that's in there. Dang. So, so let me show you how it works, all right? All right. So you'll see the boards are simulating right here and they're getting kicked over to measure. So 
So if you zip around the side, you'll see the actual rock that's moving up and down and catching those boards. Oh, yeah. So you'll see we're building a bundle over here. So we'll walk on over. One's coming out right now. It's going to come through this tunnel, and we're going to compress it and then put a strap around it. So we strap it up for packaging. Look at that whip. Yeah, once it's done, we'll kick it out. Someone picks it up, puts it on a stack. And so how this works is there's three servo motors that are controlling all the motion. So we're really, really accurate. That rack is moving around. All the boards are, are held in there. There's one air cylinder that controls that entire rack. And then what you just saw popping up, we're actually flipping the top boards over so that they're protected. So when you stack them up, you either have you know, face down on one side or face down on the other. So it's super safe. That so you can actually awesome. see how that row came in upside down. All We're right. doing that, and if you watch real close, you'll see it right about to happen. Come up and we flip it over. And it's finding the ones that fit. Yep, and uh, the whole time it's doing, it's nesting, it's putting all these sizes together to get you, you know, 82.5, 84, 81.88, 82.388. Extremely accurate. So So essentially what you just saw happen, those bundles are made in about 45 seconds to a minute. You know, it's, it's uh, generally it's about half as much time as a person making it, but where all the money is, you can save labor, that's great, yeah. you can do all that math, but where the money is, is in a flooring plant, you're going to make anywhere between 10, 15, 20, 40,000 square foot a day. And we're usually saving guys about two or 3%. So you take 50,000 yeah. square feet and you know, an average price, let's say at $2 a square foot, there's a lot of money that they leave on the table that now they're keeping. This is an impressive machine. Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, what does one of these machines run? So as you see it right here, you know, you get the in-feed system, the whole rack nester, computer control and the strapper, you're at about $200,000. 200 grand. Yep, so usually in, our, in this setup, your payback's about 18 months or less. Epic. So everything you see here, all the steel besides this piece of equipment was 100% made in the United States. We cut on our laser, we cut oh, on our cutoff machine. We have two CNC laser, two CNC mills, two CNC lathes, welding robots. Um, welding robots, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the arms? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and you, you guys got to come check it out one Yeah, day. definitely. I think We'd you'd love enjoy to make it. the trip. Oh, We'd yeah. love to. Uh, so uh, on our clamp carrier, so, so the clamps oh, you guys yeah, have, this. so this is like the next step. Yeah, you know, I see. Our clamps are right there. Yep, yep. And so those clamps are 100% welded on a welding robot. So, so our a manual who does it, he has two stations of welding robots. He loads in a few pieces. Welding robot goes and finds all the spots, hits the weld, and then he takes it out, puts it in the next station. Weld, 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 weld. Oh, so you don't even have people welding anything. Only when we robot. do big, big, big ones or ones like that. Yeah. Your okay. monster clamp. These are your adapters, so you can do the thick stock. So these are do about four inches thick, and now you can get to the eight, 10, 12 inch stuff. Yeah. You know, but they're a big, big clamp, heavy duty. You know, one, again, 100% welded, made in the United States. Do the, do these come like? How long do these come? Usually we do them in about 32 inches. Right. So you can see them is taking your clamps, and we're just putting them on a carousel, and then you have instead of tightening by hand or with anything else, yeah. there's a built-in air motor in there that it as we push it, it forward, it spins and comes forward. If you pull back. It goes forward and spins in reverse to loosen them. Yep. And then overhead panel flattener, basically do what you're doing your handheld, but you just drag it around on the carriage. Yeah. A lot a lot easier, a lot faster production. All right, so here's the quick rip. Take your board off the pile, you load it up, press the process button. It's gonna traverse across. There's a sensor every foot that measures the board's profile. And all that's sent right to the computer. So you can see it right here. Here's the board we just scanned. So you get the average width 
what's usable. And now you see this thing called skew amount where it says zero inches. We have the rip system. We designed something called skewing. So I'm gonna do a little trick to show you how it works. Let's say you have a really bowed board and you think you can get a little bit more out of it. And I'm gonna demonstrate that. Our system will do is pick it up and skew that board so it's straighter for the rip, but it might go into the board that's all crooked. So you get a little bit better yield and I'll show you that right here. By skewing that board two inches, we increase the yield by 16.5%. That so, is awesome. Does this do four quarter and eight quarter? So this will do up, yeah, it'll do eight quarter and a little thicker. So this saw can do up to four inches thick. Damn. Yeah, so we have a machine in uh, England that's running four inch thick timber. So, and if you look in here, you'll see, you got, we have one fixed blade. There's four moving blades inside of there that are computer controls. Those blades will open up and close to hit the pockets that we want. That is awesome. And then what happens, we, we feed the board in, it goes through the saw, comes out, and this is our opposite end of a green chain. So the boards will travel all the way to that black curtain over there, sensor turns on, rollers drop, chains advance, and that's where you can sort your lumber right off of there. Gotcha. So this is for the high production 12 boards a minute shot. Wow. So I can use the controls to pick a pattern. If I don't like what I see, I can tell it I want something next. The lasers show you what the blades are gonna do. So I'll show you again. I don't like that I'm getting two three and a half inch rips. I'm gonna hit next. So you'll watch on the screen. Now we're getting three twos and now the lasers match. Damn. So I can also jog it left and right if I don't really quite like how it placed it. I can go well, back really to the sensitive. original. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea wow. being that you can just place it right where you want it. Maybe you wanna keep that whole edge. Maybe there's a knot. Uh, I might want to go, I need a couple two and a halves or whatever it is. I can also hit a button and I can just straight line it. What we'll do is, I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to hit the process button since there's no board in front, I'm going to hit it twice. It gets sent over, picked up. So Mark's gonna run a little bit for you. Again, doing our little trick, showing you how it skews. Straightening that wow. board right out. Wow. Yep, and here comes another one right through. They're so quiet. Yeah, yeah. For a saw, that's quiet. Yep. So, so that's ripping. Now over there we have two chop saws. So basically, what our chop saw does is you take these boards, you mark out your defects, and we have a crayon sensor that picks up where all the marks are on the board, gotcha. and you tell it, let's say you want to make some table talk. That's the quick rip. This is the quick chop. The, chop. One of the, uh, the engineers at our company, his name was Brad Quick. So he had a great last name, and since everything's a little fast, we can call it Quick. But so this machine was redesigned about five years ago to be faster, more efficient, safer. So how it works is you take our board. If there are any defects, you mark it with a crayon. If there's not, you can just send it in. We do have a printer that would let us print what this thing is, what the length is, or any special identifiers that you want to have. So we'll take a board. This one seems pretty good. Just put a couple marks down the end. Everything else looks all right. We drop it down into the cage. I'm gonna start the saw. Now we have a cup bill loaded right now where we're cutting 35s right here. Now I also have another cup bill in panel E where we're cutting 36, 12, 48, 16. So we're gonna run this cup bill and that's associated to, to uh, E, so I can actually hit it on the keyboard. And since I'm using the keyboard, it, you know, it's trying to be safe, wants me to unlock it. So I'll do it again, board drops in, oh, carriage scans it. It's gonna start pushing it into the chop saw blade and chopping it.
So as we, as I told you, you got, here's your print, so you know exactly what it is, so you can go in the right pile. And here's our scrap that we marked off, which just goes in the waste bin. Wow. The, the whole idea is we are extremely efficient at how we optimize. So you go from these giant dumpsters of scrap to very small pieces. A little firewood. Yep, and then you can see here how we optimized. So here was all the scrap, I marked that out, so it was throwing it out anyway. And here's our first 36 inch board, our next 36 inch board, our 16 inch board. And it tells you that you got 91.1% yield on that board. Wow. So the model we have here is the Delta model 250. This is a side down draft booth. Positive air comes from the top of the booth. But as you spray, goes and exhausts us through the side. The side of the booth has uh, polyester filters with pockets which contains the paint and lasts longer. It also has a baffle system and you can uh, balance the booth according to the airflow and according to where you're spraying. Oh, these? Yes. Gotcha. This booth also is one of my favorites because some of the booths also have like a filter bank in the middle or in the corners, which kind of eliminates some space sometimes. This booth in particular I like because it has a full working space and you have the full ceiling of filters, which allows more airflow into the booth. So all the lightings, we have four, four, eight, four feet lights and we also have eight foot lights in the top. So it'll give you a better view from the top to the bottom to the port. Wow. This is, this is the state of the art spray booth right here. Correct. Wow, look at these doors. And where are these fabricated? These are fabric in Tracy, California. Gotcha. The north side of California. So you got a trifle doors here, which are very easy to open and close. So this is just the one entrance door. Like if you need to just to come in and out, just one person, you're able to do that. Oh man, I like this. That, there you go, that's our flag. So the exhaust vents will be right here. So if you have a Delta model, you'll have two exhaust banks on the side of the booth, which you can go up and straight out to the roof or to a wall. Now next to it is the mixing lab, which also has a man door here. You can take a, a, few, a, a good view of this. It's all just one unit, one square unit, where you have your paint booth, you have your mixing lab, you can also have a sanding station on this side. So here in your mixing lab, you're able to store your paint, all your gallons and materials that you need. It's easy to access to the booth. I always recommend to have a mixing lab next to a booth or attached to it, so it eliminate dust going in as the painter comes in and out of the booth. Wow, okay. okay. All right, here we have, a, we have a control panel. When you get an air makeup unit, you come with this control panel. Here's for your lighting. Spray with lights, mixing that lights. Okay. Here's where you go to want to spray, so you see the fans rotating. Gotcha. And then if it's like really cold out there or something, and you need some heat into the booth, you want to spray like in 70, 76, you would turn on your heater, and you can put your, you can set up your temperature in there. And uh, how, so if there was a sanding booth, this center here, and then the spray booth, spray booth what does a system like that cost? This system goes for like 98,500 $98, bucks. So from here, let's walk into the sanding booth, which is an open face booth. It has a filter bank in the middle and also has that door in there that makes it easy access and going into the mixing lab. Dang, this would be so awesome. So we are the manufacturer. So we do manufacture as customers needs. We do our own lighting, we do our own fans. So we're able to help you with sizes and dimensions. You said $98,000? 98,500, yes. 98,500. Tyler, go up to that blade for me for perspective. I'm bad for Stand perspective, next to man. <laughs> Just to put in perspective how thick this is. Yeah. Sick, man. actually came here as an invitation from our business mentor that you guys have heard about. His name's Steve. And you're about to get the first glimpse of him. There he is. 
Yeah. There they are. Oh, man. Up, <laughs> How you doing, Steve? So, what'd you think about that experience? It was uh, pretty informative. I mean, uh, definitely came here just looking for, uh, you know, maybe some new tools. Not as much knowledge as we got, that's for sure. Yeah, I wasn't expecting the knowledge. I was got expecting just a bit. A good day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, knowing we did the glue wrong this whole time. Mm. Like, <sighs> well, yeah, you know, you live, you learn. Hey it man, is. they got type three. <laughs> you just didn't get much of it. All right. right. So we got to implement what we learned. Yep. Uh, let's see. We found a good bit set. Yep. We saw amazing finish. We saw an amazing finish, right? And we also got to see how to mill things the easy way mm -hmm. as long as you have like a half million dollars yeah <laughs> yeah just starting off at least a half a million dollars right and the cheapest robotic arm okay. cheapest robotic arm is only a hundred thousand yeah, dollars i mean it's not that bad, really so if you want to be top notch in the woodworking industry start with a million bucks that's it that's it that's all you gotta do that's all you gotta do for the rest of the people here who uh, don't have a million bucks, then you know, stick with your planers and your joiners and your uh, basically your back and your elbows. Yeah. That's really where you're at. Your biggest investment right there. Right. Don't cut your fingers off. You only got ten. Yeah. Now what's also really cool is this whole place is built on top of a huge parking garage. So we just went down like eight floors below what where we were just at oh nice we parked in a really good spot uh -huh. this is this huge maze here is built for go-karts but there's a lot of cars in the way yeah and that's okay 